All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I am Tyler Tone, the president of the USF First Amendment Forum. We are a two-pronged group. We host discussion events every Wednesday at 7.30 on issues that matter to students. Uh, we have a lot of food, by the way, and cool sunglasses. Um, and we also, for our second prong, we use this free discussion as a teaching tool for the value of the First Amendment and constitutional principles, cultivating a base of activism for leveraging policy change that respects students' constitutional rights to free speech and due process. Now, the purpose of my organization, I collaborating with our partners here to bring you this event tonight is not so much related to any specific topic, but about the tradition of debate and my deep, deep belief it belongs integrated into the mission of higher education. Uh, this is why First Amendment Forum exists. One of USF's key four values is inquiry. Can you imagine inquiry without debate? Debate exists as a indispensable mechanism in the process by which inquiry is pursued. Without it, it only exists in a incomplete form. Now, there's a way in which debate in recent years has gotten a bad rap. It's, you know, the, the domain of YouTube hacks who own their opponents, or it's an avenue that inherently advantages malign actors. In putting an event on like this, and the one like it we did last semester, we we're trying to say that no, debate has a proud tradition, not just in the West, going back to ancient Greece, but across civilizations, going back to the Han Dynasty, who organized formal debates on the monopolies on salt and iron. It is inherent in the way human beings work things out and come to a higher truth together. And I'm proud tonight to bring you an event that is properly understood in this long continuum. And I thank you for joining me and helping to promote a tradition of debate at this school, which will hopefully continue long past my graduation. Now, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Jennifer schubert -Aiken is chairman and CEO of the Steamboat Institute, an organization she co-founded in 2008. The Steamboat Institute promotes America's first principles and encourages civilized discourse by hosting debates on college campuses like this one across America. Jennifer is a member of the advisory boards for the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado at Boulder and the Ed Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets at the University of Maryland. She also serves on the board of directors of Rebecca's Angels, a nonprofit organization helping children with post-traumatic stress disorder, founded by Boston Marathon bombing survivor, Rebecca Gregory. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, it, it's great to be here in Tampa. Um, and I want to say, seriously, a special thank you to Tyler and the First Amendment Forum. It was because of their persistence that we are here in Tampa tonight to host this great debate for you. They really do believe in debate, and I hope you will support the First Amendment Forum and the, the good work they're doing here on your campus. Um, also want to say thank you to the College Democrats and College Republicans uh, for co-hosting tonight's debate with the Steamboat Institute. You know, just people ask all the time, how did you get that name, the Steamboat Institute? Well, it actually does not have anything to do with actual steamboats, the boat. Uh, we are named after the ski resort town in Colorado, Steamboat Springs, Colorado, which has received over 300 inches of snow so far this winter. So I'm, I'm glad to be here where there's green grass and palm trees. Um, Steamboat Institute was founded in 2008 for the purpose of educating people about America's constitutional principles and fostering an appreciation for the freedom we enjoy as Americans. We have hosted dozens of debates on college campuses all over the country over the last six years. And you might say, why all these debates? Well, it's because we can't maintain our democratic republic without citizens and leaders like all of us who are not capable of civilized debate and discourse. Um, that's how we solve our nation's problems. It's people with different opinions coming together and being able to talk to each other and discuss these problems. It's an honor to kick off our spring 2024 debate series here at the University of South Florida, because over the next seven weeks, we are visiting five campuses in four states, uh, there's a unique debate topic at each location. I'll just tell you quickly what they are, and then I believe we have some flyers out here tonight. Um, after tonight, our next debate is March 21st at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. 
on Is the American Dream Dying? April 9th will be at the University of Colorado in Boulder discussing Is AI a Threat to Our Democracy? On April 10th, we'll be at Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction discussing whether the U.S. needs more nuclear energy. And we will wrap up the spring tour at Cornell on April 23rd with a debate on our universities failing to provide a culture of free speech and open inquiry. You can watch um, all of these debates uh, uh, on our either live by registering uh, you can watch a live stream. We have uh, several people watching a live stream tonight. Uh, you can go to steamboatinstitute.org to see more details on these upcoming debates if you want to know who the speakers are and, and all, all those good details. Um, yeah, another thing you might want to do, uh, especially students, can keep in mind you can host a watch party uh, to watch one of our upcoming debates live. You can participate no matter where you are, anywhere in the country. We'll send you a box of free Steamboat Institute swag so it makes it fun if, if you if you want to host a watch party. Steamboat Institute is proud to partner with the First Amendment Forum here at USF to offer this shining example of civilized debate and discourse of our nation's most pressing problems. We want to show that this is possible. As with all of our Steamboat Institute debates that we hold on campuses all over the country, the emphasis is on how to think, not what to think. You are always welcome at a Steamboat Institute event, regardless of your opinion on the issue, as long as you're willing to listen and learn from our speakers and to show respect for your fellow audience members. We have a special opportunity coming up for students and young professionals ages 20 to 29. Each August, Steamboat Institute hosts a two-day freedom conference at the Beaver Creek Resort near Vail, Colorado. People of all ages come from all over the country to attend this event. We've been doing it for 16 years now. They get to meet and mingle with our nation's leaders in government, education, media, journalism, entertainment. Uh, we have some really great speakers. For our young leaders and, and those of you who are students in, in the age range of 20 to 29, we offer scholarships that cover your travel, lodging, meals, and registration at the Freedom Conference. In early April, the scholarship applications will open. It's very competitive. I encourage you to apply. Go to steamboatinstitute.org in early April. It's really a great opportunity uh, for students and young professionals to come to this event and meet um, others from all over the country. Finally, before I uh, introduce our speakers, as a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, Steamboat Institute relies on the support of many generous individuals and foundations to bring programs such as tonight's debate to audiences across the country. I would like to say a special thank you to the Adolf Coors Foundation, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, and the Jack Roth Charitable Foundation for their support which has allowed us to expand the Campus Liberty Tour debate program to reach more campuses across America. Colleges and universities have long been bubbling cauldrons of conflicting ideas and debates. One of the debates currently roiling many campuses is how to achieve greater diversity among student bodies and to ensure that all students have equal opportunities to succeed. Here in Florida and across the nation, there is much debate over whether public funds should be used for programs that promote DEI, which of course stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Tonight's program will examine this issue with a fair and balanced debate on the following resolution. Be it resolved, public funds should not be used for diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in higher education. So you're going to hear a pro and a con. We invite all of our audience members, both here and those watching online, respond with your view on this question, agree, disagree, or undecided, before the debate begins. You, you will see uh, cards if you're here in person. Uh, there's a card, use the QR code, use your phone. If all of you participate, it means so much more uh, when we see the, the results of the polling. So uh, agree, disagree, or undecided. So uh, there's the resolution. Uh, if you're watching online, you can also participate in the poll. So we encourage everyone to do that. Once the debate is over, we're going to ask your opinion again. And so the idea is we can see how opinions have shifted. So it's, it's not so much about winners and losers, but it's about how did opinions shift? You know, did undecideds go one way or the other and, and that sort of thing? So 
Uh, now, I would like to invite our speakers and moderator to come out on the stage, and I will introduce them. So let's welcome uh, Richard Corcoran, Carrie Sheffield, and Amisha Cross. Come on out, Carrie. Okay, arguing the affirmative on tonight's resolution is Richard Corcoran. Richard was named president of New College of Florida this past October. During four terms in the Florida legislature, Richard was a staunch advocate for improving all levels of education. His eight years in elected office culminated with the speakership in the Florida House of Representatives in his final term. Subsequently appointed as Florida's education commissioner in 2018, he navigated the reopening of Florida's schools in the fall of 2020. Richard grew up in Pasco County, Florida, and earned his bachelor's degree from St. Leo College and a JD from Regent University. He has been a member of the Florida Bar for 24 years and served six years in the U.S. Naval Reserve while in college. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Richard Corcoran. Oh, not quite yet. I'm sorry. I'm going to introduce all of you. That, that, was, that was my mistake for not letting you know. I'm going to introduce all of them first, and then they will make their opening statements. Arguing the negative on tonight's resolution is Amisha Cross. Amisha leads media strategy, press outreach, strategic marketing, and external affairs for the Education Trust. Prior to joining Ed Trust, Amisha was the state policy director for the Pretrial Justice Institute, where she served at the intersection of government affairs, advocacy, and strategic communications. Amisha has education experience across various nonprofits, including the National Black Child Development Institute, Chicago Public Schools, City Colleges of Chicago, and more. She also worked in communications for former Vice President Al Gore, former President Barack Obama, and former Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Additionally, Amisha is a political contributor across cable news platforms, Sirius XM, and iHeartRadio. A native of Chicago, Amisha holds a master's degree from the Roosevelt University in public administration and a bachelor's degree in political science and journalism from Belmont University. Let's welcome Amisha Cross. And our moderator for this evening's debate is Carrie Sheffield. Carrie is a columnist and broadcaster in Washington, D.C. She's a senior policy analyst at Independent Women's Forum. Carrie earned a master's in public policy from Harvard, concentrating in business policy. She earned a BA with honors in communications, uh, with honors in communications at Brigham Young University and completed a Fulbright Fellowship in Berlin. Carrie has been published in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the New York Times, Washington Post, and many others. And you will frequently see her as a guest on major media networks, including Fox, um, Fox News, Newsmax, MSNBC, CNN, and others. So welcome to our debaters and moderator. And now I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Steamboat. And thank you to all the student groups. We're so glad to be here, uh, glad to have this civil exchange. Uh, I'm grateful to Steamboat for elevating the debate as, as their motto. Um, so just want to remind everybody, I think we've got some good uh, civic participation here on our poll. So we're going to close the poll here very shortly. So I just want to remind you, if you have not entered in your poll here before the debate, please go ahead and do that. And then once we have the debate, we'll go ahead and do the same thing. Uh, and the, the winner is who, who moved the debate. So not where the margin is today, it's just where the change is, the delta. Uh, so we're very grateful about that. So um, as has been stated, uh, we're here to talk about the, the topic of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, you all know this topic very well here on campus. It's been a very uh, you know, central debate here. And so we're, we're, we're grateful that we're gonna have a, a very substantive exchange, a very civil exchange, um, uh, both between the folks here on stage and then we want to get you involved. So we're gonna do our opening statements. Each debater will have five minutes each from the podium. Then I'm going to moderate the conversation for about 27 minutes here on stage. And then you all are gonna get involved. Uh, if you didn't get one of these cards, please raise your hand and someone will bring you the card. Got a couple people with their hands raised. Um, please let's get them the cards. Um, we'll make sure to do it again um, after the 27 minutes. But then we're gonna do for a little less than half an hour with you all putting your questions in. And I've got an iPad here and I'm gonna 
feed those questions here to the people on stage. Uh, and I'd love to get a whole, a whole range of views. So please, please put your, your thoughts uh, and your questions and you will be part of the debate as well. So with that being said, I'm gonna invite our first opening statement uh, from, he, he's, he's already, he's warmed up uh, for five minutes. Richard Corcoran. Thank you very much. First, if it's uh, all right, I was gonna just say how I got here. Uh, I'm a president of New College, but I've been working on this book and the agent that's helping me word the book, he said, hey, would you be willing to do this debate on DEI uh, and it's against this, this guy and it's this older, white, kind of crusty guy. And I was like, yeah, sure, I know that guy. I'll, I'll debate him. And, and then it, they reach out to him and he says, well, you know, uh, the, my agent calls me back and he says, hey, he said he's not debating. He goes, don't worry, we're gonna find someone else and it's this guy and he names another older, crusty white guy who was the head of the teachers union who I knew. And I said, I know that guy. Yeah, uh, that'd be great. I'll debate him. And then he says he can't debate either. And, and he comes out. And I turned to my wife at that point and I said, you know what? I just know how this all goes down. This is always my luck is they're going to go find a, you know, really talented, beautiful black lady who is a great speaker. And that's who I'm going to have to debate. I should just bail right now. And so I'm thinking about it for a day and I got caught up and I forgot. And finally, I must call the agent and say, hey, I'm out, you know? And they go, don't worry about it, we just found this lady, her name's Amisha Cross, and he texts me. So I immediately grab my phone, and I, I'm Googling Amisha Cross, and I pick up the picture, I was at dinner with my wife, and I read her bio, and I, I say, see, see what I told you? See, look at her. And then you look at it, and I said, and look what she does for a living. She literally goes on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. She, her job is a debater. Um, and I said, this is my luck. And then on the drive up here today, I was telling Amisha, that I said to David, the one thing I don't know about her is I haven't seen her physically, but with my luck, she'll probably be like 6'2". And we walk in and say hello to Amisha, and as you can see, uh, the luck continues. But with that said, I'm honored to be on the stage with Amisha, honored to be with you, Carrie, honored to be with you guys, the students. Congratulations, USF. You guys became the second public university that's in AAU. You're just doing a fantastic job. Hats off to all of you guys. But on the topic, um, that issue is, you know, do I believe that DEI should be on higher ed campuses? Um, and this is where I think Amisha and I are obviously going to disagree on this part, but I think there are parts that we will agree on, and I'll get to those in a second. But on the first part, I not only believe that DEI should not be on university campuses, I don't believe it should be in K-12 schools, I don't believe it should be in corporations. I think that what we need to do is to wrap our arms around DEI, uh, walk them out in the back and put them out to pasture. And I will tell you that is what is going to happen. It is happening right now. Um, wherever you look, universities, corporations, uh, DEI just uh, exploded. A uh, $10 billion industry, probably close to 70% of those dollars going to hiring people in DEI, not going to students, not going to do those things that it really promises to do. And, and you're seeing just this rapid decline. State after state now is banning it. Corporations are pulling it out. Um, I would say in three to five years, DEI will be a thing of the past. Um, and that's, that's, that's what I believe. But what I want to clarify is diversity, equity, inclusion, that DEI I say that about. I'm not saying that about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are great terms with great meaning. Diversity is in our Federalist Papers written by Madison, saying that if you want to have a great country, you want to have civil discourse, you must have diversity of thought. You must have diversity of people. Um, these are great terms, but they're used in a way in DEI that is absolutely inappropriate. And, I'll, uh, you know, I have six kids. I'm reading with my 12-year-old Animal Farm, but it's literally Animal Farm. What DEI is saying, get rid of individual rights, and now we're going to go about group identity rights. And if you're in that group, you're in a good shape. But if you're not in that group, you're not. And you're seeing it manifest itself throughout the country. And it's just like, you know, the animals got together and they use these terms, this intellectual um, uh, elite, use these terms that sound wonderful, just like, you know, in, in Animal Farm, it's like, hey, all animals are equal. That's what we're about. All animals are equal. And there, there's the oppressors and the oppressed. The oppressor with these farmer guys, we got to get rid of. They get rid of them, they overthrow them. And in no time at all, you end up with a situation where, you know, the, the saying was all animals are equal. By the end of the book, it's all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And that's the problem with DEI, and we can get into that more. But I do want to say the two things I think we'll agree on is you have to be able to confront and have a conversation about things that you disagree or whether you don't like or you don't 
understand or, or believe in, if you cannot have a conversation about that civilly with another person, we'll cease to exist as a democracy, as a constitutional republic. And the, and the final thing I'll say is, what do we do to solve those things like racism, uh, of bigotry, of all of those things? In, in our country, all of the presidential candidates, they'll say, the greatest threat is China, the greatest threat is radical jihadism, the greatest threat is Putin's Russia. The greatest threat to our country is we are failing to educate our youth well from birth through college. And if we don't fix that, no matter how much we get everything else right, we will cease to be a constitutional republic in no time at all. And DEI exacerbates that. It doesn't help us. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I think that one of the things I definitely agree with Mr. Corcoran on is that um, we are failing to educate our kids in a way that gets them ready for the jobs of the future, the jobs of now, and the world that they all walk into. The reasons why I disagree are vastly different <laughs> than I think the ones that he's outlined here. This past weekend, we reflected on the 59th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Um, Bloody Sunday is its commemoration is stands um, and still stands uh, as we watch people march across, including the, uh, the Vice President of the United States, march across the Edmund Prentice Bridge in Georgia. That was a very seminal moment, and a seminal moment not only because of what it stands for in terms of the fight for voting rights, the fight for equity in health care, the fight for equity in housing, the fight for equity in education that we continue to fight for today, but it's a showcase of the fact that the Civil Rights Act happened and was passed before Bloody Sunday. Bloody Sunday was a reaction to the Civil Rights Act passing. It was a reaction to there being more rights for people who were historically disenfranchised, people who were historically seen as not human, people who were historically seen as not deserving of opportunity. We're watching that happen today. SNCC, young leaders like many of the people in this room today. The Freedom Riders, young leaders like many of the people who are in this room today. Nameless faces across the country who fought Many of them died for a level of access and opportunity that sadly far too many Americans honestly take for granted and that far too many states are pushing to have eradicated. Progress that is the bedrock of our democracy, a democracy that is set to be and was shaped to be the envy of the entire world. The democracy in the United States is one that is very different from what we see across the globe, one in which we are not a homogenous society. We are one that is built on all different cultures, religious backgrounds, ethnicities, points of view, what we look like, where we come from, that is who we are. And just because you might look different, you might talk different, you might come from a different background, you might come from an immigrant background, a disabled student, just because those things are a part of who you are does not make you lesser than. What DEI aims to do is ensure that individuals, regardless of their background, do not face discriminatory practices. Education has always been at the forefront of our civil rights fight. And with book bans, threats to curriculum, up to and including black history courses that are being banned or are telling people that slavery was, you know, a workforce development program of sorts. One that did not victimize, but one that was utilized to build an economy that worked for everybody. One that ironically slaves were included in, but whatever. Any mention of LGBT anything is considered divisive concepts. Well, if we're talking about divisive concepts and can't talk about American history, we're not talking about democracy. We're talking about totalitarianism and dictatorships because you know what? That's where they ban books. That's where they ban people. That's where they ban access. That's not who we are, and it's not who we should be fighting to be. DEI in higher education is under assault. Make no mistake, it's an ill-advised campaign and it's dangerous. It's one that affects not only black people, but brown people, disabled people, undocumented people, military people, LGBT, and other underrepresented members of the community and the student body. Positive campus climates and experiences promote access. They promote tolerance of varying views, cultures, and backgrounds. After all, that's what the college experience is supposed to be about. That's what the American experience is supposed to be about. It helps to develop a strong workforce and support and sustain the democracy that I think all of us hold near and dear to who we are. We want spaces where your body, for example, isn't limiting as a factor in your achievement. We want those spaces that allow for those who have disabilities, both physical, visible, as well as mental health issues, to be able to sustain, grow, and feel supported and thrive. We want opportunities where equity matters, 
And because a part of your college experience is to accept change, to lean in on the uncomfortable, to learn things that you probably weren't going to experience at home, we're all comfortable at home. Once you leave your house, once you go out into the workforce, once you're forced to engage with the world, you have to be ready to do that. And diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts allow a sustainable process of policies to help you to develop into the best possible American you can be. The governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, said a while ago, DEI must D-I-E. Declarations like this are scary. Declarations like this are problematic. And declarations like this could upend the very structure of what our democracy is built upon. Today, I'm hopeful you will learn a little bit more about why DEI policies are important, but also what they can mean for your daily lives and why they should be sustained across this college campus as well as many others. Thanks, and I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, since, since you went first. Um, so last year, Governor Ron DeSantis, he signed a, a law that would ban DEI on college campuses. Um, and in his remarks, he said it was an attempt to impose orthodoxy on the university. He said that it stood uh, instead for uh, discrimination and exclusion and intolerance. Uh, my question is though, based on the actions that he's done after that, including at your university, you had about 40% of the staff resign in protest uh, for some of these changes that were done at your school and some of these policies. Um, do you think that, that these actions that the governor has been taking actually risks imposing his own form of orthodoxy, that it's, it's just kind of swinging the pendulum and that it's actually just the same thing that you're condemning, but, but using different language now? I think, the, the first of all, it, it's so it, that, okay, um, it's so important that the, that the facts get out, um, Carrie, and, and I'll say, uh, first on, uh, on the facts, um, at New College, one of the first people that got appointed, he's our most, con if I, I mean, a lot of our trustees are not liked at all. <laughs> Um, but the one that's absolutely the most controversial is Christopher Rufo, who's written a whole book on uh, critical race, critical race theory, and, and DEI. And uh, Christopher Rufo was one of the first guys to come as an appointee from Governor Santos on the campus. And to Amisha's point up there about college is, the, is where you should have a marketplace of ideas. That's where every one of these students should be able to travel all of the thoughts and ideas of their mind to the fullest extent in a great um, a forum where everyone is, is being taught how to think but not what to think. And Chris Rufo comes on that stage at New College and he says, if you think for one second that we came to take a school that is hard progressive left ideologically and to come and replace it with a hard right ideology, you're sadly mistaken. This is a failure and this is too. What you want is a great liberal arts school is where, where kids are taught that wonderful education and they're allowed to uh, be, learn how to critically think and, and, and analyze and be exposed to uh, right people and left people and come up to the conclusions themselves. And that's what the governor was saying. That's what he was. And by the way, my definition of new college is not mine. If you go online right now and Google new college, if you go to the Princeton Review, if you go to any objective criteria, alumni, faculty, students, they will all tell you that it was a hard progressive of left school, and it did have those elements of DEI. And I can tell you how it manifests itself. There was zero diversity on New College. It was principally white women, um, largely LGBTQ. And now, because of the changes, um, we went up 300% in African-American population, closing the DIE office and taking that money and putting it to proper use. We went up 100% in Hispanic students. Um, the male-female ratio is now a nationwide average. Those things happened with the elimination of the DIE office, and that's what the governor's saying. What it's really being used to, we led the SUS institution of all the state institutions, somebody who comes to the school as a freshman and then leaves, we measure that the retention rate. We led the SUS in retention rate. 30 plus percent of our students would come and immediately leave because it was so toxic. 
I'm not saying that we shouldn't be fighting for diversity. The, the, the clinical definition, the clinical, the equity is in common, British common law. Uh, inclusion is a great word, but that's not DI, DEI. DEI is completely, I agree with the governor, it is, it is discrimination, it is absolutely exclusion, and it's indoctrination. And that is what we are replacing at New College and have, and the results speak for themselves. Pick up something you mentioned, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, and you mentioned it, it's almost 60 years ago. So you're talking about a long time ago, and we're talking about today. Uh, so what would you say in response to people to say, well, you don't fight more discrimination with more discrimination, that we just had a federal judge in Texas yesterday rule that a 55-year-old federal agency uh, called the Minority Business Development Agency, um, which existed to help minority businesses obtain funding, um, was... Uh, racially illegal and that it violated the Equal Protection Clause. So do you think, what would you say in response to people who say, well, DEI is actually uh, creating a, a neo form of racism or a neo form of discrimination by trying to fight discrimination with more discrimination? I think that the summation of that. Absolutely nothing um, historically or present day um, within data that supports the fact that reverse discrimination exists. It is something that a lot of right-wing talking heads would like to bring up, but there is no factual basis for it. Um, as of today, less than 3% of American doctors are African-American. Less than 2% of American attorneys are African-American. Uh, less than 1% of African-Americans are in the psychological mental health field. All, however, black people encounter these fields very often. Um, with that being said, we also recognize, and I brought up the Edmund Pettus Bridge and the Bloody Sunday conversation for good reason, because even though we're at the 59th anniversary, the Civil Rights Act has not been ratified. We're watching time and time again voting rights restrictions today be pushed against black people. We're watching time and time again the eradication of the use of historically relevant practices. When we talk about book bans, books that most of us have read at some point, books by Maya Angelou, books by some that are in the American literary canon, but books that talk about history, things that actually happened in American history. Black history is American history. We cannot talk about slavery without talking about the impact that it had, not only on the black community, but also on the economic structure that was built off the backs of black people in this country. Black people have been, were able to, black people have been slaves in this country longer than they would have been property in this country, longer than they were able to actually own property in this country. So these conversations matter, and they matter because the structure of who we are as a nation had inequities built into it. And quite frankly, across a lot of States, those inequities continue to persist because laws are on the books currently that make it a whole lot harder for black people to reach full equity, to reach full uh, the full individualism uh, and the American values that we all, I think, esteem to, to own homes. We know that when it comes to the banking and housing industry, there are discriminatory practices baked into who gets a loan and who does not. And the people who are the greatest affected by those, even with the same credit scores as white Americans, are black Americans, and they get denied at the highest rates. So this isn't a conversation about the past when the past is mirrored in the present. So you're saying that laws actually exist where a black person would not get a loan, but a white person would with the same credit. Absolutely, that's, that's, and, that's, and, and, they're, and they are actually being challenged at the federal government right now, yes. Yeah, well, I, we'll definitely watch for that, that ruling too, because I think you would agree, Richard, that that sort of thing, the explicit, explicit racism should be illegal. Um, in terms of uh, racism, though, I do want to ask you this question, Richard. Is racism, does it exist in America? And if so, what role, if any, is the university to play in combating racism to make students feel comfortable the, the answer or safe? To, yeah, no, the answer to that is an unequivocal yes. I mean, my daughter's at a law school in Florida. Uh, I won't say where. Um, and she called me the other day, and she was extremely upset because there was a student in the class um, who was spouting off um, eugenic, um, racial, um, conversation. She goes, Dad, what, what do I do? And I said, hey, the way you beat free speech you don't like is with more free speech. You know, argue back. Um, but that's America. That's what makes us great. That's what distinguishes us from any other country. Go anywhere else in the world and sit in a street corner in Main Street and say, this government stinks and I, I hate it and I want to overthrow it and see what happens to you. I don't even care if it's Canada or Britain. It's not the same as it happens right out here on this campus. Not even close. But, but the, 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 where I really agree with Amisha is that the biggest racial problem, I think, started in the 1960s. And the greatest lie perpetrated as a public policy was the Great Society. And if you look at the data, and you look at how many 
African-American kids or black kids graduated with two parents in their home in high school in 1960 versus 1985, 19, it went from 60, 70% of the kids down to where today we're probably somewhere in the ballpark of 15%. An utter destruction of the, of the black family. And so you say to yourself, how do you fix it? You fix it with education. And if you look at our education system right now, not DEI, but if you look at our education system right now, you could take that $10 billion and you should invest it right now. I've said it to legislators across the state. If I were in Las Vegas right now and I was back in government, I was speaker, I'd put all of the money I had in early education from birth to fifth grade. Your brain develops 80% by third grade and by fifth grade, there's a $10 million deficit between low income kids and kids that are not low income. And, and on top of that, if you say, okay, what's low-income kids? Low-income kids are a majority minority. And then you say, okay, majority minority. What is the minority? A majority of the minority is black kids. They are literally, uh, and, and I, I'm sorry, if you graduate out of high school, this is what we're doing in America. This is why it's the greatest threat to our, our livelihood, our, our, our success, our thriving, our, our freedom, is if you look what those kids graduate, they are either somewhat, somewhat, or fully functionally illiterate. The education that we're affording, the richest country, the greatest country in the history of mankind, is sending low-income kids at 18 out into the world with, in, in essence, no hope. Who's the most dangerous person in any society, in animal kingdom, whatever? Anybody without hope is a dangerous person. And we're just doing it year after year after year. We should reinvest whatever it takes to get our kids on grade level and kindergarten ready by fifth grade by five years old in kindergarten. If we did that, we'll change society, and all these other issues will die. But if it's not happening, and not only is it not happening, 60% are not there in America. What's the solution from a policy standpoint, though, is what can the government do to fix what you're saying? Oh, I, I can tell you, uh, I mean, you're talking to a guy who could spend all kinds of money. I mean, the first thing we should do is, is in Florida, we have early um, pre-K but it's only half a day. We should have a, a voluntarily full day pre-K and, and we should get it at a lower age. On top of that, our pre-K systems, because we just initially said, okay, let's do pre-K and so we threw money at the pre-K system. Well, what happens? There's no structure, there's no evaluation of the curriculum and so a lot of them is just glorified daycare centers. That's not helping anybody. So you should go back and you should say, here's the curriculum that we need you to teach. And so then, because if at fifth grade, if you're, not, if you're not kindergarten ready in fifth grade and right now the stats in America, and by the way, we're ranked number one K through, K through 12 system in the country right now, more, largely because of COVID. We were the only ones who said, if you shut down face-to-face -face instruction, the people who will lose the most are your low-income kids. We're not doing that to the low-income kids. There, there are many of them in single-family homes. Those folks have to work. If they don't have a place to take their kids, it's going to devastate the communities. And you're seeing that. California, New York, New Jersey, all these places that shut for a year or two years, the suicide rates, the drug rates, the crime rates, and the falling behind of those students is exponential. It allowed Florida to shoot to the top. But the, the point is, if you look at that fifth, fifth um, five-year-old test, and then we measure third grade, that's the first time we look at third grade, exact same scores. And then from third grade, we measure the last time in 10th grade, exact same scores. So I could basically say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, graduation, you have Johnny, we saw his kindergarten ready score. Uh, we're gonna put him through first grade all the way through 12th grade. Um, he scores at 40 percentile, on, on, which means he's below grade level, which means he's not even proficient, which means he's either somewhat or, or fully functionally illiterate. And, and here's our money back guarantee. He's gonna, he's gonna be with us for another 12 years. He's gonna graduate and he's not going to improve. He's done. That's a problem in the richest, greatest country in the world. That is where there are systemic problems in treating um, an absolute systemic problem, low-income people not having the same um, uh, uh, word count, two parents. Uh, honestly, if you, if you ever get married and you, and you have marital problems, I say it to my wife with six kids, and I say to her all the time, it's like, you know what? You know, I worry about Johnny, I worry about Sally, whatever kid it is, and it's like, hey, the, the data, I don't care if it's our kids from Harvard or, or Stanford Review, if you graduate with two parents in the home at 18, your likelihood of being successful is basically 90%. So I'll focus on the things that we can actually legislate um, because I think that it is, is as important as it is, I think, to have a structured family in a two-parent household. We cannot control from a legislative standpoint Agreed. whether those families stay together uh, or are married before they have children. However, what we can do 
do and what I have seen in terms of not only Florida, but several other states um, is proposals be put on the table specifically for early childhood education. When I first moved to DC, my work was in early childhood education and making sure that um, to a point that Richard made a moment ago, that regardless of where you lived, you had not only access, but equal access. And that's irrespective of race. Uh, what we have found is that young people who grow up in impoverished populations tend to have less options of where to go in early childhood education. Um, they present in something we call FFN care, uh, family, friend, and neighbor, because there is no early childhood education center near their home, or the one that is there is already full. We have to first recognize that there aren't enough teachers in early childhood education and address that. Part of that is a pipeline issue. It's hard to get somebody to sign up for a job um, that they will get paid less than if they go down to McDonald's and are actually serving you fries and drinks. That is a very real thing. We're expecting people to keep our, young, our youngest learners on track. Meanwhile, we do not pay those people as though they are professionalized in a career that I would consider is the jump start to anything you decide to do in your life. If you are not prepared in early childhood education, it is a very hard thing to get back on track by the time you're in kindergarten, to get back on track by the time you're in first grade. These are the building blocks. So we have to take as a community early childhood education a lot more seriously than we do. But in addition to that, states need to keep up their end of the bargain. When these policies are presented before them in terms of early childhood investment, it should not just be something elected officials run on. It should be something they make sure happens when they're in office. Right now, there are bills across the country that come before conservative legislatures, and when the rubber meets the road, they say no on the funds. An unfunded, unfunded mandate is not a mandate at all. Our children would continue to suffer if we do not invest in early childhood education, if we do not invest in making sure that those teachers are paid a salary that makes sense for the great provisions that they are giving to those young people, but also if we're not making sure that, and I'll, I'll give you kudos on this, that those ECE centers are adequate. I traveled this country. I went to Seattle. I went to various places in Texas. I was in Florida, not Tampa, but other parts of Florida. Um, and I saw vastly different early childhood education centers. Some places, you're learning all types of technology. You're getting the building blocks of not only our language, but six other languages. In some places, you're watching Mickey Mouse Clubhouse in a little bouncy chair all day long. That is not the same thing. So we are not setting up our children in the best ways if our early childhood education centers are not adequate and are not equal in what they are actually teaching and training those children for. Okay. Right. Well, I, it's okay. If it's okay, I, I want to steer it back to the university because we're, we're talking about the campus level. So I appreciate that this is, these are important things to talk about the root, but I do want to bring it back to university level. So Richard, I want to ask you, um, you mentioned um, in your remarks that you're not opposed to the, the concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but you don't like how it's being manifest in this acronym the way that it's actually been implemented. So if you do like these concepts, how should they be implemented? And then Amish, I'd love for you to respond to his, his uh, outline. I think you have to allow every single student that's on a campus to be treated equally. There, should, there shouldn't be a differentiation based on color. There shouldn't be a differentiation based on sex. Um, and, and that's my issue with DEI. DEI fosters that differentiation. It literally says, look at, look at Harvard. Harvard, we just went through it. I, mean, I honestly think that the best thing, two of the best things that's happened in America, one, and, and I say this, um, silver lining. I mean, two horrible things that happened to um, the world in, in America. But one is COVID. It was terrible. But all of a sudden, parents are sitting there and they're turning on their TV and they're watching what's being taught in, in a classroom and they're like, whoa, I'm not, I'm not good with that. And, and the entire education movement moved. Uh, in, a, in a positive direction. And the same thing, I think, that the horrors that took place in, in, in Israel in October 7th, but then all of a sudden it exposed that, wait a second, what is going on on these college campuses? And when you have Harvard that has a DEIB, D diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, you know, we want you to belong, and the opening line to be of their DEIB office is, is we actively recruit and uh, welcome, and then it lists who they recruit and welcome. And who's not on that list are Jewish people. Who's not on that list are non-LGBTQI white people. Who's not on that list are Asian people. That's my point. You have to eliminate that. You can't have that kind of inequality, that kind of um, uh, pernicious um, selection of a group identity against another group. That is, that is what needs to be eliminated. And I, I'll say it, it won't survive. It is so um, improper 
is the nicest way I'd say it, that it, it's not going to survive. It's, you're already seeing it. There's just rapid running from a program that now, even, and it's not me. I mean, you know, um, Bill Ackman is a guy who gave to Clinton and gave to uh, Barack Obama. He's a, a prolific Democratic fundraiser, a Harvard graduate and master's program. He's the one who went absolutely apoplectic over what was going on in the DEIB office. Um, and after seeing what happened post October 7th. And so you have to, you have to make sure that all students are treated equally on a campus. Um, and, and as far as um, what we did is we, you know, we, you, you go out there and you say, okay, um, there's clearly no diversity at New College for the most part. Um, how do we go out there? And you go out and you, and you recruit um, from IB programs. You recruit all these different kids to come. As long as they're, they meet the criteria, it's easy to make those numbers work. And there's a ton of qualified people in all different um, beliefs, ideologies, religions, colors. Um, you just got to go out there and make sure that they're there. You should feel free to respond. There's been a form of DEI in this country since the 70s. Um, and it wasn't always called DEI. But to your point, when it comes to recruitment, making campuses more, more diverse, making them more reflective of what the society looks like out in the real world, there have been efforts to do that for a very long time. Um, in, in addition to, once you increase diversity, once you have more people from varying backgrounds, you tend to also have to meet needs that you were not required to or didn't even think about having to meet beforehand. Take, for instance, increases in first-generation college students. There are first-generation college students who are going to have questions, who are going to have to have their needs met in various ways that aren't that of somebody who is third or fourth generation college student, someone who this is their first time leaving home to go away to a campus, someone who is of an undocumented background, a mixed status family. Those individuals require a different set of tools, not only to be able to um, proceed and persist throughout college, but also to feel comfortable on college campuses that in their original design were not built out for them. So I think that there are certain elements that we have to take into consideration that college leaders do, whether they call it DEI or something else, to ensure that those students not only feel safe and welcome, but also that that access point is there. Same thing for students who may not be of diverse backgrounds. There are white students who are going through a significant, all students um, since the pandemic have gone through a significant amount of mental health distress. And regardless of your race, your, your you know, income level, background, family makeup, uh, mental health and mental illness is no respecter of persons. It is uh, equal opportunity. And our colleges and universities have to be able to meet the needs of those students as well. In some capacities, DEI has offices specifically designed for student mental health. In other capacities, student mental health is housed under something else. We want to make sure that students, regardless of their background, regardless of what they may go through, have the best opportunity to move forward. And I think that attacks on DEI not only are harmful for students who are who found their home in a student cultural center, who found their home in, um, in these conversations and in these celebratory events, for their, for their culture, of which they don't necessarily always see represented on their campuses. Could that be done outside of DEI? Some organizations and some institutions have made that happen, but quite frankly, a lot still do not. So until we reach that point, it's going to be hard to argue that we need to totally eradicate something. It is not perfect. I, I'm, I'm not saying the DEI is perfect. In the same way, affirmative action wasn't perfect. Hint, hint, DEI has been more supportive of white women than it has of any other racial demographic of people. Same thing with affirmative action. It is a redress. It is not a perfect redress, but it is a redress to help to establish and eradicate some of the inequities that we see persist across college campuses today. The University of South Florida is a very diverse campus. But the presence of diversity in and of itself does not automatically equal equity. We had our first black president, President Barack Obama. And at the end of the day, that didn't usher in a post-racial society. In fact, it issued in a lot of redresses that we see that are problematic when it came to rolling back of civil rights, when it came to more um, attacks on racial diversity, when it came to more blatant exercises of white supremacist terrorism, for instance. These are things that have always happened, or so it seems, throughout history, where we move a little bit forward and then we take 10 steps back. That has been the story of the American experiment. It's going to take us a really long time to get to the point where people from various backgrounds, um, various ethnicities, various socioeconomic levels are able to fully be included in this society. That doesn't mean that we stop fighting for it. That doesn't mean that we eradicate programs that allow for the exploration of it. And I think that that is what DEI is designed to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, folks, I'm gonna turn to you guys in the audience. Again, I've got my iPad here. Um, again, if you don't have one of these cards, please raise your hand with the QR code. So just scan that on your phone and you'll be able to put your question in the iPad. Um, so I'm gonna look at it now and kind of see where we're at. Um, if, if you guys are feeling shy, I have more questions for, for our team. But in the meantime, please, please um, 
put your comments. Um, let's see, so we are waiting um, and it tells me that we are trying to connect. So. And it says zero responses, so I'm not sure. Are folks able to put your questions in? And now it's telling me that Safari cannot open the page, so. Yeah, maybe if you guys wanna connect to the Wi-Fi. In the meantime, I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask a question here of you, Misha. Um, I, I wanna read a quote here from um, a past university president from Harvard University. His name is Derek Bach. And he recently wrote in Harvard University Magazine um, following the October 7th Hamas attacks with all the campus disruption that Richard mentioned. Uh, this is his quote. He said, there is an important body of conservative thought that is now nearly nearly or completely absent on the faculties of many eminent universities. He recommended, this is the quote, some immediate progress by trying to hire conservatives as visiting professors or lecturers, while also encouraging conservative students with ability to consider embarking on an academic career. So again, this is a former president of Harvard University saying this. Um, my question is, you know, DeSantis says that in his view, he says DEI stands for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination. And just mathematically speaking, when you're talking about universities, they're overwhelmingly, you know, one ideology. They're overwhelmingly you know, in, ter in terms of who professors donate to, who they identify with affiliation. It's always going in one direction to the left. Democrats or they self-identify as progressive or liberal. So is there a risk when you're talking about inclusion that it's also for a conservative, it's, it's thin inclusion, that it's not true inclusion because your worldview is not represented. We're not having, you know, Roughly 40 to 50% of the country is conservative, 40 to 50%, it's not perfect, but, but way more than 10% or 15% on college campuses. So is there something to be said by what this, this former Harvard president is saying that diversity on campus should include ideological diversity? I think diversity on campus should and in most cases does include ideological diversity. Who somebody decides to vote for in their personal time does not mean that those are, that those are the images, those are the values that they are standing up in front of a classroom and sharing with their students. Um, I went to college in Nashville, for example, one of the most, uh, what the fastest growing city in America at this point. My advisor was a Caucasian male um, who happened to be a conservative, born and raised in Alabama, went to the University of Alabama and then Vanderbilt University. I did not know he was a conservative by the way that he led our classroom. He led our classroom on political science, on history, on the, um, the fights that uh, Americans have had uh, multiculturally across this country for quite some time. And he did an amazing job of leading both because he was an advisor to both the college Democrats and the college Republicans. I think that there are ways in which our campuses need to become more diverse, not only in thought, but also in who's actually on those campuses. Over 90% of our college professors, the tenured track professors are white. So if we talk about diversity, we also need to talk about diversity of the background of people who are teaching in front of our young people who, are, who do not look like most often the people who are in front of them. Um, and with a nation that by what, 2040, uh, by estimates based on the US census is going to be more brown than this nation has ever been. It's not going to be majority white anymore. There comes a point where you also have to be reflective in who is leading these classrooms, have more inclusion there as well. Not only inclusion of thought, but also inclusion in diversity based on the representation of what you see in front of you in your class. Again, I don't think that there is a massive issue of indoctrination when it comes to what's happening on our college campuses. If you major in, uh, in anything STEM related, you're not getting indoctrinated into anything about you know, ultra progressivism. If you decide to take a course that obviously has a progressive ideology, let's say you're taking something that is um, women and gender studies, some people would argue that that is a little bit more leftist than they would like to be a part of. However, I would argue that if you take a women and gender studies course, you're gonna learn about things like the suffragettes. You're gonna learn about 
the fight for women to have the right to choose, the right to be able to, um, you know, chart out a course for their lives. You're going to learn about the greats in women's history who've helped to develop um, the modes of the civil rights movement, because women don't often get the credit they deserve in movements that men are the forefront or the face of. I think that there are a lot of things that we can look at there, but indoctrination is not what I would call it. And diversity for diversity's sake is one thing. When we talk about diversity, there is a full realm that we need to look at. We don't have enough teachers who, or professors who represent the disability community. We don't have enough representation by race and ethnicity. We don't have enough representation when it comes to people who are non-Christian who are in front of our students. Even though our student body represents a myriad of things, that is not what's in front of them on these college campuses. Richard, I'll give you a chance to respond. Oh, I think that that stat's real. Um, I think that there's no diversity in idea, there's limited diversity among faculty ideology. I think that's been proven and it's not even in dispute. Um, and I think that at New College, the lack of diversity in the faculty, I think to Misha's point is you, you could be registered as a, a certain particular, particular, but it doesn't mean you bring it into the classroom. And I think that's true of a large number of faculty, but you should, if you want a, a, a good system, you're gonna have, I think, um, true diversity among ideology, and that would show itself out in those in those measurements. But would I that think, affect things like research, areas of inquiry? No, I think I think it's always based on you know, on all these conversations. And I, I, I as what Amisha is saying, I'm going to take that. What she's saying is, yes, once you've met the, you know, you have those qualifications, you are qualified. There's no, there's no. It's a merit-based system. You can't have a non-merit-based system and ever have it function well. Um, if somebody with merit is losing out to someone without merit. But if you're in a merit system, then certainly you should, uh, you know, and, and, and there's, you know, two competing candidates, um, you want to make sure that you have that diversity. If, if, I don't care if it's ideology or whatever it might be. If one's ideologically left and, and there are two competing candidates and the, for the second position, then I would, I would lean to ideologically right. So you have that balance. I think that should, that, that's representative. I think the bigger ideological problem that we had on campus is it's, it's a student you know, when you don't have, when you have that group think identity as opposed to individual rights, um, the group think cancels. So if you look at that percentage of students that we led the SUS in who left the university system, they're surveyed, you know, why did you leave? Um, people were leaving because they were bullied, they were canceled. These are students who identified as, as true liberals. And they were saying, I left because I wasn't liberal enough. I wasn't the right kind of progressive. And so I'm leaving. It's just an awful culture. And that kind of ideology groupthink on a college campus, which is, I think, fostered in that DI system, has to be eradicated. Otherwise, you're going to fail to give anybody a good education. And the last thing I'd say, because I, 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 I get your, our topic, Carrie, um, but you cannot solve from 18 to 22 years old that, pardon my vernacular, that you've bastardized from birth to 18 years old. If you can't, it's not possible. And so having a conversation about higher ed without saying, if we don't get this right over here, um, I don't care what we did. If we did everything perfectly, it, let's just say we did everything perfectly from birth to 22. We're talking, we're 25 years away from getting those numbers that we would want. We'd getting you know 25 years away from having maybe you know 90 percent of our, our our high school graduates or college students um, fully functionally literate. But even even Florida being number one, if we continue, we, we we did the math. If we continue the current growth rate of getting kids at grade level at the current rate we're growing in 230 years, we'll hit that 90 percent number. Um, we want to, I mean, we'll be long gone by then. It, and I, I agree with him. Education is on a continuum. We can't talk about higher ed without also talking about the P to 12 system. We also can't talk about higher ed without talking about literacy. Um, there are a lot of students, quite frankly, who even graduate high school um, it, who are functionally illiterate, reading on the fourth grade level. We've got to get to a point in our nation where we are fighting for literacy in the same way that we fight for our economic standards in the workforce, in the same way that we fight to ensure that we remain competitive, because we will not if our people are having a really hard time with the basic elements of literacy. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions here. We got, I have 57 questions, so thank you guys. And I'm glad we got it working. <laughs> I'm gonna try to pick out some of the best ones. Um, and I've got some specific ones for both of you. Um, so there's a question for you, Misha. It says, can Amisha address why public funds should be used to support DEI? And I think that the question in that is, is, you know, okay, yes, we want students to feel welcome and all that, but 
does it risk using because the Equal Rights Amendment says government cannot discriminate based on race. So maybe having private foundations or you know private philanthropists, is there a distinction from your perspective that the government versus private philanthropy should play when it comes to helping specific racial groups or specific gender groups, things like that? That's a really good question, It's and it's both. Um, it is a both and, it is not an either or. When we talk about public funds for public education, we're not talking about public funds going to private institutions. Public funds have always gone to public education, and public education um, helps to advance equality for all. I am a natural believer in public education. However, when we're seeing things on, on our college campuses that are exclusionary, be it whether it is um, it limited on free speech, be it whether it is students of certain religious groups and backgrounds who do not feel included, be it whether it is um, your, your um, parenting students who are your non-traditional students when, when they enter these college campuses that were built for 18-year-olds, not for 25-year-olds with two kids. When we have these conversations about military, uh, military folks who come back to school or are going through this process, their needs are different than your average student who just graduated high school and is going to college for the first time. Those people make up a part of our college campus and our college culture, and more and more every day, we're seeing that diversity rise, i.e. more of those students are a part of our public education system. It is the responsibility of public dollars to be spent in reasonable and responsible ways, but also to ensure that our public institutions thrive, and more of these students, more students from a vast variety of diverse backgrounds will only be able to thrive if they have that level of support. That's not to say that private dollars and private support shouldn't also happen. We see that happening in community organizations that are also very very strategic about how they spend DEI dollars, but public institutions should be publicly funded up to and including DEI as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and in terms of the, um, what you're talking about supporting people who have these backgrounds, we had the Supreme Court ruling though on uh, affirmative action to say that that, you know, you can't proactively, you know, have race be a criteria when you're talking about public for college admissions. Yes. It did not say for public funds. Yes. Um, I think that there has been a chilling effect across the United States of people who one read that ruling entirely incorrectly, but also people who are applying it at the state level in ways that it's not even to be applied from the federal standpoint. Um, as somebody who's worked with the NAACP LDF and as someone who's worked with institutions across this country, what we've seen is a chilling effect again. And states' attorney generals, particularly conservative ones, are excited about that chilling effect in the misreading. Of, of the Supreme Court decision. It is narrowly focused on affirmative action in admissions. It has absolutely no leveraging point in DEI. It has absolutely no leveraging point in accessibility on these college campuses, nor does it stop uh, people of minority backgrounds from attending institutions or even writing about race in their essays or anything like that. What we've seen is a vast misunderstanding and misinterpretation of what the Supreme Court decision did. What we've also seen is that misinterpretation being weaponized against students of diverse backgrounds, which I would consider extremely saddening, but we're also watching, and I'm thankfully so, a part of a civil rights coalition that is working across multiple states to ensure that students receive the equity they deserve and that Questions like this are addressed in very real and meaningful ways that also is backed by legal representation to push back against some of the very ill-fated and quite frankly purposeful, purposefully misleading ideas that we're seeing come out of various institutions. Thank you. Uh, and Richard Free, you've got a question here. Mr. Corcoran stated that DEI is very similar to Animal Farm, but wouldn't banning or restricting its use also fall in line with another central theme of Animal Farm that the that be, that being the restriction of the freedom of speech. No, I think it's a DEI is the uh, squelcher of speech. It's not. Uh, the, it's the opposite. Um, so if you want, I'll take our campus. You know that cal cancel culture I talked to you guys about. So you're in a classroom and you say something, and there's the group identity thing, and the, and the someone says something that's i.e. conservative or. Uh, maybe it's a, a religious comment or whatever it might have been. Um, the the group cancels. I mean, part of that, and I think that's what the governor is talking about. It's um, this is it's exclusion. If you're not part of the group, think. If you're not, just like Harvard's DEIB opening salvo says, if you're not this, you're not welcome. Everybody should be welcome on a campus. And that comes with, when you're not that and you're not welcome, the next thing that happens is the silence of speech. You, now your speech is, is uh, causing me to be triggered. Your speech, I need a safe zone. I need all these different things um, to protect myself from a speech that I don't like. If you hear somebody say something that you don't like, the greatest a fight back against that is more free speech, not the squelching. And DEI does the exact opposite of that. 
That's so, how, and, and that's how it's manifesting itself. I'll, I'll just, you know, I think I agree with the, uh, um, Amisha's uh, assessment of the case. But that was an emissions case. But, but I think at some point, everything has to be judged on, on, its, on the facts and on the merits and on, on the outcomes. I mean, it, where, where you have these DEI, and the reason I'm so confident it'll go away in three to five years, you know, Mississippi spent, uh, or I think it was Alabama, spent millions of dollars in DEI, and they said, okay, you know what, for Alabama and Auburn, they're two public universities, we're gonna use the DEI funds to try to increase black enrollment. It went down by like, you know, 7%. Michigan said, we're gonna use our, our DEI funds to increase black enrollment from 16 to 22. It's gone down and they're up to about $100 million. I mean, at some point, you know, where you have policies that are enacted, whether it's a city, a state, at some point, either your cities are safer or they're not. Either your kids are learning to read or they're not learning to read. Either families are staying together or they're, or they're breaking and they're not together. At some point, the metrics matter, you know, and, and, and what we're seeing in the metrics of DEI is that it is that not, it's not just that it's not working. It's working backwards and hurting us in the progress that we have made. Thank you. All right, I've got to keep going. I've got 66 questions, so thank you guys for keep there. Keep coming. I mean, here's a question for you, and I'm going to put a little context in it. Um, the question says, can Amisha explain how and why demanding white people apologize for their skin color isn't racist? The context of this question is Chris Rufo, who's on the board with Richard, um, had done some investigation here at this campus, and it found training um, that encouraged white people to feel, to feel guilty or some sort of... Um, apologetic for their race and then try to, uh, you know, redeem themselves by doing activism. Um, what, what, have, what do you make of those types of trainings? Those are, that is not the intent of those types of trainings. I will say that when those types of trainings happen, when these are supposed to be enlightenment trainings to a certain extent, to provide a historical and present day context of how we got here so we can avoid the mistakes of the past moving into the future. Um, as someone who is greatly bothered by the, and I think everybody in this room probably is, by the horrors of the Holocaust and the fact that the Americans, our government, we knew about it long before we jumped in. That makes me feel bad as a person. I wasn't even alive. None, I don't think any of you guys were either. Um, but I think that when you, there are certain points of our historical memory that can make you feel so bad that you didn't do something, that your people didn't do something, that your nation didn't do something, that isn't meant to make you eradicate or dismantle your race or step us. I don't expect white people to all of a sudden not want to be white because slavery happened. What I do expect you to do, and I think what these trainings expect you to do, is to look at the outcomes of slavery. Look at the outcomes of Reconstruction. Look at the fights that happened post the Civil Rights Movement. Look at what we're fighting today and understand your place in it in terms of what we can do to move the country forward. It is not designed to make you feel bad about your personhood or your history. You weren't even alive during that time. What it is designed to do is to help you to understand how we can get out of this, to help you to understand the mistakes that were made from the past that actually, in many cases, have inequities that are certainly built into some of the laws that we see today, and to give you marching orders Orders as to how you can change and help the world become a better place, help your community become a better place. It is not designed to make you eradicate or, you know, erase your identity or your history as much as it is designed for you to understand where we were so that where we are going is not a mirror of the past. Richard, here's a good question for you. Can you explain the difference between equality and equity in education? The, uh, the, again, equity is not a bad word. Equity is a, a concept, a concept from common law that um, you know has been around for since Blackstone. The, but on an equality says that everyone will be given that equal chance. And what equity in diversity, equity, and inclusion has become is equity of outcomes. And that is, and that's where the problem lies. Is you can't have you because that will inherently create a massive injustice. How could somebody, you know, if you have two farmers that are living side by side and one's not, you know, hypothetically, this is a, 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 an economist um, viewpoint, but, you know, how long does this, it's, and that's your society of two people, and one guy gets up and he tills the, you know, uh, the fields and milks the cows and does all the work and the chickens and the other guy doesn't, and then at the end of the day, they say, okay, for equity of outcomes, we're going to say, we're going to take whatever this guy generated from his farm, we're going to split it equally among those two people. You know, that's also the promise of animal farm. Hey, we're all going to be treated equally. And, and it, it's never the case. I mean, I think one of the great philosophical underpinnings of, a, of, of thought that every student should wrestle with, every person should wrestle with, is philosophically, 
um, where does man lie historically? Do we lie as, a, as individuals that tend to move toward goodness or do we lie as individuals that tend to move toward selfishness? And, and that's a significant um, differentiator. But, but that, those both farmers should be given the equal opportunity. They should have the op equality and the opportunity for them to go out there and to farm and, and produce um, great wealth for their families and what have you. But equity in diversity, equity, inclusion, it says they should have equity and outcome. And that is inherently unjust. It is inherently wrong. It is inherently un-American. I love how you bring up equity in farming because there is also a federal case against, um, against farming organizations that have been inequitable in how they are pushing for pass-through funds, specifically for white-owned farms versus farms that are owned by black people. So even when all things are created equal, i.e. they're tilling the land, it's fertile here, it's fertile here, they're having the same outcomes. One group is still ending up tremendously better off than the other one. I don't think there's an argument to be made. I think that there's a very important distinction between equality and equity. Um, if somebody is doing a lot more, regardless of the race of said person, um, and the outcomes are different, that's a result of the fact that that person is doing more. Equity is a different conversation. And I think that when we have, in this context, what we're broadly talking about is equity, not equality. Um, because again, this is largely outcomes-based. We tell how far people are going by where they've been. We have measurements of things that show us what outcomes are. Um, you work in education. Um, at the end of the day, yes, outcomes matter. We are measuring outcomes on a daily basis. That's how we tell whether programs, policies, and other things are actually working, outcomes help to show us that. Within those outcomes, we look, at our, we look at our subscripts and they tell us by race, they tell us by other demographic markers, how a particular group is doing at any particular time. There are always external factors that may play on that and we recognize that as well. And in this conversation, I think that we will continue to have that as well. Amisha, here's a question. Do individuals who promote hateful ideas also deserve equal treatment? Equal treatment in what? They didn't say, but let's just say equal treatment uh, on the campus. I've never been on a campus where people who express hateful ideas aren't given the voice to express said hateful ideas. Um, there have been, and, and Tennessee, because that's, I graduated college in Tennessee, they invited the Minutemen on campus. They invited individuals on campus who stood, who are not law enforcement, who stood at our southern border with guns ready and willing to shoot undocumented migrants as they crossed the border. Students, self-included, would walk out of those conversations because we didn't advocate for them not coming on campus, but we did advocate for ourselves to not be a part of that conversation. There are always going to be people who are going to present ideologies that you may not agree with. Shutting those ideologies down, I think, is profoundly wrong. However, walking away from something, walking away from a conversation that is completely um, outrageous to you and your personal values, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, we should not be threatening people. There's a way to have those conversations and have a meeting of the minds. Well, it depends on what the conversation is. We're not meeting of the minds on, on, on racism or on violence. That's just not going to happen. However, I do think that, again, campuses are a place, specifically college campuses, are a place where diversity of ideas come to thrive. If there's somebody you don't like who's invited to your campus, nobody's saying you can't not protest against them. People do that all the time on campuses across the country on various, uh, various ideological playing fields. However, I think that there is a lot to be said about still allowing that person to come onto your campus because that is, in my view, how democracy works. Thank you. Uh, Richard, here's a question for, I think that fits for you. Uh, the, the questioner says, I like DEI on the basis that it supports educating the public on the hard truths of history. And the question just scrolled down without me. I'm sorry, I lost it. <laughs> Got a mind of its own. Da, da, da. Hard truths of history. I'll start again. I like DEI on the basis that it supports educating the public on the hard truths of history. When learning concepts, especially on a university level, we all learn perspectives that are, we, we learn all perspectives and are given the ability to form our own thoughts. Do you think taking away DEI takes away the ability for individuals to form their own thoughts? No, I think you're conflating understanding and being taught history with a program, DEI, which is geared towards saying that if you're in, if you're one of those that are actively pursued and invited in, you're okay. If you're not, you're not. That is not history. That's not historical. That's what everyone fought against for years and years and years. Go get but any quote. I don't care if you take Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King, all of them fought against that kind of, uh, of mindset and thought. 
the, the history should be taught. And I think Amisha made a good point. I'm, I was Secretary of Education. The only thing that has happened during my time in Florida and what I've watched Governor DeSantis do is say that books have to be appropriate. No, I don't think that I want my six-year-old or seven-year-old kid reading a book that's graphic and has sexual um, uh, illustrations in it. In fact, some of those books that said people said didn't exist, they're not in classrooms, um, were bought to press conferences that the governor held. And as soon as he held up the books and the pictures that were being shown to kids in first, second, and third grade, the camera shut off because you couldn't show them on TV but you can show them in a classroom. That's what he's talking about. Age-appropriate books should be pulled. And, and to Amisha's point, you know, there, there are people from the hard right, they'll say, you know, Aldous Huxley, A Brave New World, that should, you know, it talks, has all these sexual relationships. I think everyone should read it. I mean, it, it's one of the great dystopian novels at the high school level. It's one of the great dystopian novels so that you should be able to read and say, okay, this is a dystopian novel. How did they break down a society? What did they do to break down the society? And the first and foremost thing they did in, in Brave New World, which is different from other dystopian novels, is they said, we're going to break down the family unit. And you look where it's been broken down in our society, and it's an abject chaos. That's a great book for people to understand how do we succeed in creating a good and just and true society. So, and so history should be taught. I'm even of this opinion. I want my professors to teach DEI. The, I want them to teach what DEI is, what happened with DEI, how it came about. It's a, it's a historical underpinnings since the 60s in the last 50 years. They should teach that to students. What the governor and what myself are against is you shouldn't indoctrinate people and say, this is what DEI is and you should believe it. No, but oh, I don't care if it's critical race theory. I don't care whatever historical thing that has happened. If you're teaching a history class or a political science class, how could you say in the last 30 years, this is a, something that happened with race relations and then you're, you're censoring and you're saying we're not gonna have a discussion about DEI or CRT? That's what a classroom should be. That's the discussion that should happen. But having DEI be a policy that we invoke and have people come comply with it whether they want to or not, is inherently the opposite of that beautiful freedom that should exist on, in, in a marketplace of ideas on a campus. All right, Arisha, I'll give you a chance to respond to him, and then we're going to go to closing statements. Absolutely. Um, I, I actually agree with several of the points that he just made. But I think that when we talk about, in, in a utopian society, DEI wouldn't be needed on any college campus because everybody would be doing a great job. They would be working to ensure that their campuses are diverse, not only in terms of students, but also in terms of faculty. I, I do believe that you're actually do, doing the work at New School to make this a reality, irrespective of what happens with the, or what has happened with DEI laws across the state. But every university leader is not a Richard Corbett. We have several university leaders where this is not a priority. We have several university leaders that are absolutely fine with their campuses not being reflective of the world that the students in this room will walk out into. The great state of Florida is probably one of my favorite states in the sense that it is a representative of the diversity not only in this state, but the diversity across the globe. It is one of few states that has that level of diversity. That level of diversity is not always represented on our college campuses, and it's darn sure not represented in campus leadership, <laughs> nor the programs that are available in several of these uh, in several of these campuses. It's important that we acknowledge, um, and I think that Harvard got it wrong in this sense, that not only diversity and e equity and inclusion is a, a vital program and policy for um, the progress of students, their retention as well as their graduation rates, but also that it is not exclusionary. Um, in the campuses that I've worked in and the campuses that I've worked with, um, there isn't a student union group that students who are not a part of that group cannot attend. So if you're a black student, it's a black student union. They have white students in there. They have Latino students in there. There is no exclusionary practice associated with building towards equity. And I honestly think that it works better when you have students who also do not represent the name on the badge of that door, quite frankly, because you don't have to teach black students a lot of history about black people. We already been there, done that. We were born black, we'll die black unless something Michael Jackson-esque happens. For the most part, we got it. It is a, 
better and a more punching statement to invite other students into that room where they can learn more about us. It is one of the reasons why I joined Latino student units, one of the reasons why I joined Jewish campus organizations in undergrad. I'm a Christian, I'm Baptist, but I wanted to learn more about the experience that they've had. And I think that it's vital that we keep those lines of communication open and that for these campuses where that level of diversity in terms of its uh, community organizations and its school climate exists, that students of all backgrounds take advantage of it as well. Thank you, Misha. Richard, you got five minutes and then five minutes and then we're going to go to the polling. So um, I think you can start voting now. Is that right? So people, if you want to, based on what you've heard, if you want to change your vote, again, the, the, the poll is at the bottom of the card. So again, if you didn't get a card, raise your hand. The website to vote in the poll, you can register that now. Uh, we're going to put the results, the after debate results up on the screen. So Richard, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that this is, uh, you guys have been a fantastic audience and I think the wonderful thing about uh, what we've been talking about, it, and I think Amisha said it well early on, is, and this is the point I want you to take away, you know, where I was talking about if you graduate from high school and you have two parents in your home and the likelihood of success is like 90%, and Amisha's point was you can't legislate that, you can't force that, nor should you in many cases uh, do that. So you ask yourself, what's the next best thing? What's the next best thing we can do to create a wonderful and a great and a true and a beautiful society and the answer is unequivocally, is give everybody that world-class education. You know, I, I mentioned Frederick Douglass, you know, he escaped slavery, and Frederick Douglass said that education is the uplifting of the human soul to the glorious light of truth. And to deny any single human being that right to that kind of an education is a crime against humanity. And so I think the entire emphasis of what needs to be done is we have to fix education. And, it, and that conversation has to start at birth. If, you, if, if the conversation is only about very select programs like DEI on a university campus, you're totally missing the forest for the trees. We have to grab hold of every single human being in this society and give them the dignity they deserve that comes with a world-class education. And if we do not do that, I'm not being pejorative when I say we'll cease to exist. Even our founding fathers, you, you know, when they came out and they formulated a republic and they asked, you know, what kind of government did you give us? And, and the famous quote is, we gave you a republic if you can keep it. Because you can't keep a self-governing society unless you raise up a populace that understands what it is to take part in a forum like today have full civil discourse, have a radical conversation about a very controversial topic, and do so in a way that has all of us at some point in time saying, I really did not like one iota of what I heard there, but you're here and you're listening and you're contributing. That is what is the formation, the founding building blocks of, of a great society. And, and if we don't do that, if we don't get that right, these moments will cease to exist. And, and the, you know, I think we've talked at length about DEI, but DEI, make no mistake about it, is a dramatic setback from the, that type of progress. It is everything that, even though it's a pejorative statement that the governor says, it is discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination. That is how it is being implemented on campuses and across this country. And it's being seen now. It's be, it being seen by people with all ideologies, with all backgrounds, all colors are saying, wait a second, this is a problem. And it doesn't mean that we don't go out there and solve the injustices that exist in a society. You have to, but we should do it in a way that absolutely succeeds. It is not only not succeeding, it is setting us backwards. And so uh, with that, I just want to say, uh, Amisha and Carrie, thank you very much. And uh, Steamboat, it's been an honor to participate. Thank you very much. Either those chairs get lower or my knees are giving way each time I sit in them. Um, <laughs> Respect your knees while you can, students, because once you hit that 30 plus mark, it's a different situation. President John F. Kennedy posed the question, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. You've heard a lot to today from various sides of the aisle on where DEI stands. I say that the question that was posed here was originally incorrect. Ask not whether DEI should be publicly funded, but rather are you prepared for the devastating cost of defunding it? When we think about exclusionary practice. When we think about the history of colleges and universities across this country, they were designed by their very cultural representation to be exclusionary. 
they were only for wealthy white men. That means no women, no minorities of any kind. Hell, not even any poor white people. If you didn't own land, you still couldn't go. The idea was that there were other opportunities for these people and that these people did not have the right, nor should they be allowed to pursue higher education and the careers that are open to you once you have that level of access. And sadly, far too many politicians today are looking to create a reverse order where we go back to that function. That should bother us all. Will DEI solve it? Absolutely not. Can it get us to a better place of campus inclusivity? Can it get us to a better place of graduation rates and persistence rates across multiple demographics? Yes. And yes, if employed correctly. So I agree with Richard on a couple things. First off, not every university has employed DEI in the correct manner. Some were ostensibly horrible, and the outcomes show it. Others have done a really shining job that the nation should be proud of. Moreover, whether colleges are doing it well or colleges are doing it poorly, students from diverse backgrounds and experiences will be a part of your college culture. They will be a part of your college population. And that shows no signs of stopping. We have to make sure that we are creating college campuses that are not only reflective of society, but also allow us to go out into those societies and be the best people we can possibly be. Our job, not only as instructors, leaders, people who work in policy and politics, people who work in, um, in, in education leadership, is to ensure that the people in this room and the rooms like it of college students are ready to go out into the real world, take it by storm, be the great innovators, leaders, future workforce, um, the individuals who have ideas that are well beyond what we could have ever thought of or imagined. That is our job. The way we do that the most effectively is not only by fighting to have more diverse people in these seats, but also fighting to ensure that those diverse people understand their place in the world. I know a girl who went to college, first generation college student from a single parent household, had a parent that was incarcerated. That parent died within her first year of undergrad. Four months after that, her little brother committed suicide. She adopted her three younger siblings, still went on to persist and graduate as a double major. I know that little girl very well because that little girl was me. When I think about college persistence, when I think about the hard work that it takes as a college student and not your traditional college student, I didn't have anybody to look at in my family who, could, who I could go back to and say, this is, these are the steps you need to do to make it out. And quite frankly, look to the left, look to your right, there are a lot of people in college who come from two-parent households who won't graduate. There are a lot of people who come from multi-income households who will not graduate. We have to make sure we've created a world in which our college campuses aren't only reflective of the outside, but also are reflective of the challenges of the outside so that we can help them to better be prepared for them. College didn't determine my path at home. That was determined before I was born. College doesn't determine the paths of most of us, not when it comes to what's happening in the outside world. Just like kids who go to school in K-12 every day with their backpacks ready for that, it does not eradicate when you're in that classroom that you may not have food when you go home, that you may go home and there not be a parent there, that you may go home and you're parenting your own siblings, or that you may be that 15-year-old who's working two jobs and is sleeping in class because he worked those two jobs and took care of his younger sister and his mother who is having mental health issues. I've mentored those kids. Those kids deserve the best shot at the futures as well. DEI helps us to be able to understand that the world around us sometimes doesn't resemble the world that we know or the world we grew up in, but we still have to be able to work with these individuals to understand the plight that they may have and to be able to work in a field where the person next to you in that corporate office may have an entirely different background and experience than you do, but you still got to get something across the, across the finish line. If you don't have those experiences, if you don't fully understand what it means to take all of that in, you're going to have a harder time and you're going to be less competitive in the workforce and in this global competition that we call America. Let's keep it going.
All right, thank you all. And again, please, please go and vote. Uh, I think we're gonna put the results now, the post results, the post debate results. Um, just while you guys are doing that, I just wanna thank both of our panelists. Amisha, I think I speak for everybody here. What you just shared about your background is inspiring and the obstacles you've overcome and sharing more about the obstacles that a lot of the students uh, who are from disadvantaged backgrounds and, uh, and the support they need. So thank you for sharing that perspective. And Richard, thank you for sharing the perspective of widening the conversation to its, you know, that if I'm paraphrasing you right, that DEI is, is sort of a Band-Aid or a, kind of a too late impact that should be happening much sooner in the pipeline. So thanks for your perspective, Richard. All right, we got our votes. Like the pre-debate poll, we had 51% agreeing with the resolution, and now we have 38%. So I cannot see the numbers of, of, uh, of the votes. Uh, oh, that's totally. not displayed. That would be on our website later. But it looks like right now, as you can see, as you take the time to vote, it is changing as we sit here. So I don't believe the results. <laughs> <laughs> As of right now, it, it, looks, it looks like the, uh, there. as of right now, it looks like there there was a, a, a shift in the uh, those who disagreed with the resolution from forty two percent up to fifty percent. Uh, we, as I said, we will post this on our website, steamboatinstitute.org, and also this will be included on the video that will be on our YouTube channel that should be up probably by Friday, so you will be able to see this and and share it with others. Um, so as it, as it continues to change, and you, you can only vote once, so you know, it's, 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 not, it's not rigged in that way. We really do try to make this fair. I wanna say thank you again. This is how issues should be debated. Would you agree? Let's give a round of applause to our, to our speakers. Just to take one minute here to wrap up, I would also like to thank the First Amendment Forum, Tyler Tone, uh, the College Republicans and College Democrats. You guys are doing good stuff here at USF. I would also once again like to thank the, the foundations who make our work possible and on all of the donors, but the Adolph Coors Foundation, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, and the Jack Roth Charitable Foundation for supporting Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour. If you enjoyed this evening's debate, of course, we would love to have your support. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, you can visit steamboatinstitute.org to make a donation or to get information about our upcoming debates. Uh, we would love to have you join us in person or virtually. Remember, you can always participate no matter where you are. Uh, there were probably people uh, voting who were watching online tonight. Uh, finally, this debate will be available in its entirety on our YouTube channel, probably be up by Friday. Uh, so please feel free to share that. We encourage you uh, to share that. For those of you watching online, thank you for joining us tonight. If you're here in person, we're going to go up to the third floor, have a, a reception, a little something to eat and drink, and you can visit with our speakers. But just on behalf of the Steamboat Institute and our friends here at the University of South Florida, thank you for having us and thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs>